terrain tough off-grid setup this one's big guys stick around watch this dust extraction Karani Camping with you again. This is a Network RV Terrain Tough. Love these vans. And this power system that we've installed for these guys, a full off-grid package here, will allow these guys to run their air conditioning, have their microwave going, they want to run an induction cooker, they've got a toaster, they've got a coffee percolator, washing machine, your hair dryer, you know, charging laptops, charging cordless drills, cordless equipment, chainsaws, the list goes on. Basically, this will allow your whole caravan's electrical system to run all from batteries. Quite amazing, really cool to be able to do it. A lot of new vans are starting to offer this as a, as a system. Um, we, we differ in the fact that we customize it and design the system on your consumption. So we, we will ask you the appropriate questions to size up the system. You know, your, your caravan's not gonna spit out a power bill It'd be good if it could, but it can't. So we have to work out the devices that you want to run. You know, if you've got a compressor fridge, three-way fridge, we work that out. And your hot water service, if you're able to run it from the battery bank, if there's enough battery capacity, and solar, obviously. obviously. And obviously, we also take into account the vehicle, your tow vehicle that you intend on using uh, on a daily basis to tow this, because we don't want to overload the alternator. In other words, we, we customize the system based on what you have and what you do. And in my opinion, I think that's the best way to do it. Because when you take that tailored approach, you're not left with something generic, you know, like a pre-built board and here you go, it'll do this. Um, everyone's different and that's why everyone has a different electricity bill. In your household, everyone has different power requirements. These are the facts. It's, it's not rocket science to work it out. But when you do, the outcome is a system that just does exactly what you intend it to do. Let's get into the nitty gritty and all the specs. So as you can see, all of the Victron fruit here, bar the DC charger, which we'll get into shortly. So this has the Victron Multi Plus 12 3120 amp inverter charger right here, running all the factory outlets, fully integrated. So this will also fast charge when you are on mains power or running from a generator. You can also control the current limit on this. So if you run a generator like a little Honda One or something with a very low uh, output, you can prevent it from clipping off and continue to run all of your van's devices. You know, have the air conditioner going 
and put your kettle on and it won't trip the uh, generator out because you can actually throttle the control. So it's very smart that you're able to do this with this um, MultiPlus. And it's all done at the touchscreen, which I'll show you shortly. Now the solar controllers in this, there is a Victron 30 amp smart solar controller here and a Victron 50 amp smart solar controller here. So this 30 amp has uh, two 200 watt panels going through it. And this 50 amp has three 200 watt panels going through it. So that's a total of a thousand watts guys on this network RV terrain tough. So a thousand watts of solar. There's actually still room for about another three to 400. And we've left a space here. If old mate should upgrade to a third solar controller and network it later on, he can, but he's happy with a thousand for now. Serbo GX there to integrate all the products up on the touch screen with the touch 50. And you can see all the LMI bus fuses and I'll zoom up in a, um, in on a minute for you guys so you can see it. And the Busman Master Fuse, 95 mil cable, very heavy duty stuff. Uh, you got the smart shunt down there. We've done a Victron negative bus bar in this one because there are a lot of negatives on this. And you can see it's all tied in nice and neatly. Uh, same deal, where are the batteries? Tunnel boot, once again, guys. So we are adhering to the standards like we, we should be doing from the point that they were introduced, which is like November this year. So we're getting ahead of the game and doing it from, we've been doing it for a couple of months now, and this all complies to that standard. So when I take you around to that tunnel boot, I'm gonna show you what we do in that tunnel boot area to keep things happy. Um, and it's all about the venting and obviously keeping the batteries separate from the habitable area, which is obviously, you know, inside your van. Now this DC charger, we've got the Enerdrive 40 plus DC charger. So Basically, the reasoning behind this is old mate's got a BT50 and he's already got a dual battery system on that. So he's sucking a fair bit of energy from that alternator already. Um, he actually doesn't have his vehicle with him. So I'm unable to inspect the existing Anderson plug on his vehicle. So I don't know what gauge of cable it is. Now, I, with a 50 amp charger or 40 amp charger, 6 BNS is, 6 BS is the minimum requirement direct from the starter battery. If you don't have that gauge cable, because that's that's what we fit through the drawbar, if you don't have that gauge of cable, the charger just won't kick in and hold that, you know, it's not gonna hold that charge. The reasoning behind this one is it's fully programmable. Okay, so you'll see me use the Red Arcs, you'll see me use the Orions, uh, which is, you know, the Orions are fully programmable, and obviously the Enerdrives are fully programmable. When I have the space to fit an Enerdrive 40, I like to use them, obviously, I can program it right up to 50 amps, okay? So you've got a 50 amp setting, you can go to 40, 35, 30, you can, you can taper it down. Now I've set this one to 35 amps, Un, unknown to see this, you know, Anderson plug, like I said, 35 safe. Now all I gotta do is make a phone call to the customer and tell him how to turn it up to see if we can really load that line up when we go away. There it is. So what we'll do now is I'm gonna take you around to the tunnel boot now I'll zoom in, in on all of this stuff down here and we'll get into some real techie stuff and I'll show you what's going on down here and explain it all in simple layman's terms. So yeah, there's the multi 12 3000 120 amp inverter charger and we are running 95 square cable here. So that's the 95 mil cable and that runs into the batteries which are just behind this. So it's not a far run at all. It's actually very close. That's the Enerdrive 40 plus DC to DC charger. We've also put a side mounted Anderson plug and that feeds into this for portable solar. So if they do run portable solar on this, it will contribute to the system. It won't shut these down at all. It'll actually add to the system and it's all monitored up on the, um, through the Serbo GX up on the Touch 50. There's the smart shunt down here. Now there's the uh, Victron negative bus bar I spoke about because there were a few uh, too many negatives on this to go to the one post, so we've split it off through this. We've got 50 mil running to that bus, and that takes care of all the charges and the high current. There's the LMI bus system fuses split through the middle. So on this side, we have trail safe fridge, 12 volt main, and then we've got solar 30, solar 50, and DC charger. So in form, once again, DC charger, 50 and 30, and they're in a line right there and easy to see. So we're running a compressor fridge on this so there there is a fuse for that this cheeky one that we've added for the customer uh, we did a quick uh, rewire for him because he's got a diesel heater that he fitted himself under the um, cafe lounge area and it was on a um, you know merit cigarette socket that he was just plugging into the factory circuit on the wall and you know when the glow plug was running 
it was like nine to 10 volts under load. So I knew instantly that it's, you know, the plug is a limitation, obviously the wiring in the wall, it was never designed for a diesel heater in mind. So we have done a full circuit to here. His diesel heater will probably operate better than it ever did before. So that's that cheeky little fuse down there. All right, so that's just a little, been added for him. Uh, yeah, so solar 30, and that's got the 400 watts going through it. So two 200 watt modules are going through that. Three 200 watt modules are going through this 50 amp smart solar controller. These are networked together and they do talk to the system. So they, they understand what's happening at any moment in time and they will throttle forwards and backwards as associated. Uh, vented behind it, not required, but we do it anyway. Vent down the bottom there, you can see, and at the back, it's hard to see as well, but it's oh, right in that corner. Uh, let's go around to the battery area and I'll explain what's happening there. Let's see, here's the tunnel boot area. And then we have it. So there's 620 amp hours of power pull lithium batteries here. And there's the vent. So that is a filtered vent. There is a filter under this lid. So hopefully the dust ingress isn't too crazy with this. So it's um, being a sealed environment. It, we need a vent to obviously vent to atmosphere as per the new requirements. And this will do that. That's an 80 mil hole there. It's um, quite a large vent, uh, but being filtered, hopefully it stops the dust ingress into this area. Um, and there we go. So there's the isolation switch too that you can see up there. So we're starting to fit the isolation switches. Um, it's not required, but this is a master kill. So in the event that these guys need to turn their batteries off to weld on it, to work on it, store it, whatever they want to do, they want to, they need to be able to shut the system down. They can do that quite easily. It'll just save those um, phone calls, I guess. Um, you know, not a requirement, but I do get the odd one where someone's working on their van and they need to uh, shut the batteries down or shut the system down there's a million reasons why it's just so much easier to fit this switch so um, in line with us changing and pushing these new standards we are going to be fitting these switches as standard with any fitment pretty much from now onwards uh, it adds a bit of cost but look at the end of the day it's it's just another feature that um, will add to the value i guess you could look at and also usability you know if someone needs to pull the batteries out they don't have to worry about diving into the system and shutting things down sort of, you know, technically like that. They've just got to grab a switch and pull it. You can even remove the dial on that switch too. So it's a, almost a lockout, uh, which would be another really good point if you were to say store your van at home in a shed somewhere and you wanted to disable those batteries completely from the system and have them just sitting there. Um, of course, you still need to be able to make sure they, they maintain their state of charge, which you can see on the top of Paul's batteries, he's got his little gauge. So if you wanted to look at that as a guide of where they're roughly sitting, you could. Um, you know, it's up to you guys, whatever you do with that. While I'm doing this, so the Mopeka, that's the LPG gas tank sensor. Uh, they basically look the same as the water tank sensor. So if you guys want your water tanks monitored as well as your LPG metal <laughs> gas tanks, not the um, composite bottles. These won't work with those guys. They just won't stick to the bottom. But if you want these, if you want to monitor grey water, you know, LPG, fresh water, drinking water, whatever water tank you have, poly tank, metal tank, whatever you want, these are the go. Now I'm going to show you live how easy these are to sync up with the Touch 50. It's very easy. This is brand new in the box packet. They do actually come in the box now. And I'll show you how simple it is to set this up. Now I'll do it here, I'll set this up here and we'll call it say LPG1. And if old mate has LPG2, will you do LPG2 and so forth. And we'll show you what it does. So from the home screen, touch, go to menu. Now we'll go down to settings and we'll scroll all the way to in and out. I forward slash O, okay. Bluetooth sensors. Enable. Now it has found my Ruby tags and temperature sensors in my van because I'm only some, you know, 
eight, nine meters away, pretty impressive range. Now, if I, I grab my sensor, keep an eye on that screen. So you hold the sync button down for about five seconds, I believe, and watch what happens. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. There you go. It's as simple as that. Now I do recommend doing them one at a time and actually getting a texter and labeling what the sensor is associated with. All right? Otherwise you'll, you'll get mixed up. So if I turn this one on now, right, as soon as you turn it on, as soon as you enable it, when you go back to the main menu, it will come up. Now it's instantly come up as a fuel tank because this is an LPG sensor. All right, If it was the water one, it would come up as a water tank. Now to go into it, you can set it up with all of the details. So you can see the sensor battery, so it's pretty good. We'll go into setup. So here's your capacity. Here's all of your details of what's going on now. First of all, we know it's gas. So we're gonna change the fuel type, uh, the fluid type to LPG. So you scroll down, LPG. All right, very easy. Volume unit. Now, you can look it up. I believe if you go to liters, for a nine kilo bottle, it's about 16 to 18 liters, all right? So you wanna set your capacity. Now I'll be on the frugal side, so I'm gonna drop that down to about 16 liters. All right, so there we are, 16 liters. If you don't have a full bottle, all right, or if you don't know where, if you don't have an empty bottle, you're going to be putting this on and measuring roughly where it is, okay? So that's why once you fit these, it's best to fit it to a full bottle initially because then you can zero off your full setting. So I'll flip you around. You have two settings, sensor value when empty, sensor value when full. Now, if you wanna know what your sensor is reading, you go to that. Now this is on, I've got a little tab over this, so it's not reading anything at the moment. But that will start reading something when I put it to the tank. Now it sits in centimeters, okay? So if I had an empty tank, it might measure 1.2, I don't know. My point is you don't know where you are in the tank until you drain a tank or fill a tank. So sensor value when full, you'll only know that number when you fill it up. And it will, if you have a full bottle, it might say 18.2 centimeters. Well, you would make that number in here. So you would enter 18.2. Enter. Sensor value when empty. Now I'm gonna leave this one at zero and we'll do it like that. Now when I go to pages, it will show up here. Now, because we've also, we've got these on now, there's another setting you can change to give you that beautiful looking screen that we all love. And we'll go to display and language. Now see where it says show tanks overview. Turn that on. Now when you go back home, you're going to see that extra screen. Here it comes, there it is. Now we have categorized this as a fuel type, so we'll put it all under LPG. So however many sensors you have with LPG will come under that setting. If you've got water tanks, it'll give you another option to have the, the separate water tanks. Now as you can see, it's reading nothing. And take note, it's got 16 liters there. All right, that's because I set it for 16. It's so easy, guys. And that's how easy it is to put a Mopeka sensor on. There's actually no installation involved, really. You just, you know, it's, that's, that's magnetic. The, the rare earth magnets, I believe, they're very heavy duty. And I'll tell you how heavy duty they are. I've got two of those 3.5, 3.7 kilo gas bottles on the drawbar of my caravan. And mine are just stuck straight underneath, right? You put your little bit of jelly on. Mine have been there now for six months. I've done dirt roads, you know, bashed around potholes. Mine are still in situ. I'm not gonna say that's a guarantee that yours are not gonna fall off. I'm just giving you a testament with my experience on how reliable I find these for me. Now, obviously, when they're, you've got a poly tank or a water tank, you're not gonna stick them on with a magnet. Even with a metal tank, I wouldn't do it. The water tanks come with a separate little mounting system, all right, with VHB tape around it with an activator, very similar to how we fit solar on the roof of a caravan. So you crack your little activator glass bottle, you know, you, you scratch up your surface, you clean it, and then the shroud sticks straight underneath it and then you push it in place. And if you ever need to replace the battery, you just pop it off. It's a very secure way to have 
these sensors for your water tanks underneath your caravan. And I know what you're thinking, you know, stone smashing it. Put it out of the line of fire. You can see where all your stone chips are. If you've got a new van and you're concerned in that, well, just get a bit of foam from Clark Rubber or some sort of padding to put over it. They're very thin, they're only eight mil thick, so it's not gonna protrude very low. Uh, they are IP rated too, so they can take a bit of, um, you know, a bit of ingress. So check them out, guys, Mopeka. Um, you know, solar for RVs sell these. I, I don't sell them, I just love fitting them because they, they work. And they're very accurate. Uh, which leads me to the next point of discussion, and I will take a seat for this one. All right, so with the onset of these new sensors, these ultrasonic sensors, um, compared to other type of sensors that are out there, so pretty much every caravan, most caravans you guys are aware of, uh, come out with the, uh, you know, the little arm, you know, like BM Pro, other brands run them, and they are, there's just an arm with stainless screws sort of spread a couple of inches apart, or 50 mil apart, and as the water level rises and touches each one, it creates um, you know, resistance between them. And then that's spat out as a display in the form of empty, quarter, half, three quarter, and full. It's accurate, but whoever fits the little arm might not do it properly. And the arm, the arm needs to sit at the kind of bottom of the tank and at the top corner of the tank. So as you screw it up and it, you know, the grommet compresses itself and seals the hole, that arm must remain at the bottom of the tank. If the arm lifts up, it's not going to be accurate. So it comes down to the fitter at the end of the day, and I've seen some pretty average stuff, but even then, they're still very inaccurate. They don't, you know, like I said, they only tell you sort of quarter, half full. If fitted properly, they are not bad, but if you want more accuracy, there are better options. That's the way to go. But I'm going to talk about the differential pressure sensors compared to ultrasonic. So you can look it up, differential pressure sensors. Uh, Enerdrive do them, Cymarine do them, the Cymarine system runs them. We fitted lots of them. We love them, we still do like them, uh, love them. But let me explain the difference between differential pressure and the ultrasonic. So ultrasonic measures, all right, it sends a signal up and it bounces back and it measures the, the height of the liquid or the headspace, okay? So the signal goes up and it measures the time it comes back. So that's why it's accurate with tank level, which doesn't matter what tank size you got, as long as this will read the top of the fluid and the top of the tank, that's the way to go. So they're very accurate, there's no tank intrusion, you're not drilling any holes, it's, they're amazing, that's why I love them. And these are the current go-to. Compare this to differential pressure. Differential pressure is like a little sensor that goes at the bottom of the tank and it measures pressure. So just think about that for a moment, pressure. Now, for, you, for those guys out there that um, run a jerry can with water in it, you will understand this perfectly. Any sort of jerry can or any bottle situation, You've got your tap at the bottom of your water tank, you know, your little jerry can. If you crack the water, so it's full, crack the water, fill up your water cup, have a drink. You will notice the tank will start to suck in on itself if you don't open up the top lid. In other words, that's your breather. Once you open that top lid, woof, the water comes rushing out at the rate of the head pressure. So the less pressure you have on the head, the less water that's gonna come out. So just think about that in terms of pressure, less pressure, more pressure. If your tanks in your caravan have a very poor breathing system, so your little breather right at the top of your tank that runs out to your water filler, generally it should be higher than your tank, otherwise you'd have water coming out. If your breather system is kinked or horrible, which I have seen so many times, I'll see people turn their pumps on and I'll watch their tanks shrink and then it goes and then they continue to shrink as you start sucking water out of it, and then they go almost like those jerry cans that don't have a breather. You know, they take six years to fill up your boat or car, you know, but as soon as you crack that breather, whoosh, out she comes. With pressure, it's the same thing. So just imagine that little sensor on the bottom of your tank. So differential pressure here. As you turn the tap on, right, you're sucking water out. Now, there's a certain amount of pressure on that. If the tank can't breathe properly, that pressure is going to be inaccurate. In other words, you are not seeing an accuracy up on your screen with differential pressure if you have a poor tank breathing system. Now we are seeing this more and more common on generic brands of caravans that try to fit breathing systems that all tie into one. You know, the worst I saw was about five water tanks installed on the caravan and yeah, five tanks had four fresh, one one grey, no, four fresh, one drinking. And the breather system was all daisy chained with each other. 
and you know there were there were scallops in the line so what happened was is water would fill up in these scallops of the breather and you could hear it bubble and gurgle now you know i knew it was throwing out the pressure sensor because i could watch it so we would fill the tanks and we would watch the pressure sensors peak and then within an hour they would be settling down to a certain number in other words it was just throwing the system way out and you know then on a hot day there would be different pressure on the tank because it couldn't breathe properly and the numbers were you know way out was saying it was full and really it was half my point being is we don't do many of the differential pressure sensors if the tank breathing is horrible that's why we use these now 100 percent. i get i guarantee you guys if you put these one of these on your you know water tank you're going to see unparalleled um you know tank levels you, you're going to know exactly where you are because this knows the exact height of your water level it knows the distance between that surface and the top of the water it's very simple so i try and tell people to zero off right the bottom of your tank as the, the, the minute you start seeing your water spit and spat you know getting air sucking air stop it wait for a few seconds go up to your screen and zero off that tank whichever obviously not lpg whatever water tanks associated with that and zero it off because that means your sensor it might even say three centimeters so it's still measuring three centimeters of water but it's enough to be you know below your water your water pickup it's a good time to zero it off and even if you want to make it maybe half a centimeter above that so you get a bit of a pre-warning that's up to you guys i, I do that that way i get a little bit of a pre-warning before the tank's actually going to be empty so good little tech tip for you guys differential pressure versus you know ultrasonic ultrasonic way to go love it more versatile use them anywhere all right time for some rundowns so we are off grid we're at a caravan park but i am set to inverter only we'll make sure we are so we'll go inverter only beautiful so we are not on shore power yep there we go so nothing coming in from the shore we're just on solar it's overcast day here in adelaide and we are 83 percent state of charge and we have an AC load of 16 watts, just probably things on standby so forth. So got a microwave down here, we've got the Ibis 4 air conditioning here. So we'll get that cranked up. Yeah, it's a bit of a cool day here in Adelaide. So we'll pump this up and we'll see what we can get out of it. So we'll start with a microwave. Oh, a fruit cake. I don't want to cook that. Oh, yummo. All right, so we'll put a, put a bit of water in there flatbed microwave here so it's the nc flatbed uh, we'll go start 30 seconds we'll go microwave so 620 amp hours of power pool lithium batteries there and that's the numbers right there so running the microwave cool we'll do the air conditioning and we'll go if you got it on heat we'll go cold 16 the the Dometic Harrier Plus and Harrier Light and the Ibis 4, they've all got the same touch panel and you guys will relate, they're horrible to touch, they're super sensitive or I don't know, but hope they improve that one, but uh, either way. So we'll go 16 cold, you can hear it ramping up. The Ibis 4 off grid. Good while it's ramping up. Oh, it's cold air coming out of it. We'll put the microwave on at the same time. Here we go, start. And have some microwave and Ibis 4 batteries. What have we got? Cool. We're going to compress the fridge, guys. Obviously running as well. That's all going. Yeah, we've got lights. We're, we're, we're camping in this thing at the moment. Yeah, this is the, a real world test here. But how easy is it to see? You know, it, it's all in front of you. You can see your solar, you can see your battery, you can see your AC loads. You know that you're not on the grid. You can see your inverter is inverting. It's just so easy to see. You want more info? Touch it. Menu. It's all here. There's your battery. Inverter charger, left hand solar. There's that LPG tank we just added. Right hand solar. You know, notifications if you get alarms, settings. Let's dive into the battery. So if I want to see, now I, I set these guys up free camping last night, so they use like 15% of their battery. Um, look at their consumed amp hours. 
See, so we've used 113 amp hours from this 620 amp hour battery bank. Time to go, look at that. Over 10 hours remaining at the current usage, guys, running that air conditioner. History. Whoop. There you go. I see the full works here. Deepest discharge, last discharge. How many times you've charged the battery? You know, minimum, maximum voltages here. Time since last full charge. That's, you know, yesterday when we charged this up before we set the guys off. Now look at this. Low voltage alarms. Discharge energy, charge energy. The whole show is all at your fingertips. You get lost, hit pages, it'll always take you home. Home screen, another format to look at, and your control screen. So from this screen is where you control your AC current limit and the inverter mode. So AC mode is inverter mode only. Even though we're plugged into the power, it's not looking at it. If I was to put this on on or um, charger only, it will accept the AC current limit and decide what to do with it. AC current limit, so if I'm running a generator, I would set that to a really low number to suit the generator. We're on a 15 amp supply, so if I was to turn the grid on, crank that up, I would leave that at 16. Default at 16, the caravan will run completely normal as it should. So if you're on a station stay or a 10 amp supply and you use a little amphibian plug, drop that to 10 amps. It will stop the amphibian from tripping off. There we go. Mm -hmm.